highest estimates I've now seen for rate hikes is 10. And that may sound like a big number. Oh my God, the Fed is going to hike rates 10 times in 2022. That's how serious they are about fighting inflation. These guys are really on the job. They are inflation fighters. They're going to go medieval on inflation. We're going to get 10 rate hikes and that is scaring the markets. And in fact, if you look at the yield curve, the yield curve is actually flattening because investors are actually starting to price in the recession that this hawkish Fed is going to cause by jacking up interest rates so much with these 10 rate hikes because the 10-year bond yield is factoring in a drop in rates that will follow all these hikes because all these hikes are going to cause a recession and that's going to result in the Fed reversing course and lowering rates. Now, here is the reality. And again, this has barely begun to set in on Wall Street. I mean, when more and more traders grasp this reality, there's a lot more downside in stocks. But more importantly, if the Fed acts to stop the carnage on Wall Street, there is way more downside in the U.S. dollar, way more upside in gold. And of course, bonds are going to get destroyed even if the nominal price doesn't fall because of Fed buying bonds. The real price will collapse much further. But 10 rate hikes is nothing. Assuming all 10 of these hikes are quarter point hikes, after 10 of them, Rates are at 2.5%. Big deal. Inflation is 7.5%. And of course, it's actually 15%. But let's just use the government's numbers. As phony as they are, we don't have to use the real inflation rate of 15% to prove this point. We can accept the government's distorted version of reality and just say it's 7.5%. Well, even if the Fed raises rates to 2.5%, you've got 5% negative real interest rates. You're not going to fight inflation with 5% negative rates. There is no history that shows this. I mean, it's impossible. It contradicts any type of economic school of thought that you want to put forth. And in fact, if the Federal Reserve raises interest rates 10 times and each one of those hikes is 25 basis points, by the time they get to 2.5%, real yields will be a lot lower then minus five, because by the time the Fed gets rates to two and a half percent, the CPI will be at least 10 percent, maybe more. So the Fed will actually be further behind the curve when it gets to two and a half percent than it is right now at zero. It's because moving so slowly allows inflation to accelerate because the entire time the Fed is hiking rates, it is still pursuing an expansionary monetary policy. But the real risk that the markets still don't get is even if 10 rate hikes push the U.S. economy into recession, and they probably will, I think the market is getting that right. That's not going to bring down long-term interest rates because the reason that people think the Fed will be able to fight inflation with these small rate hikes is because they realize correctly that even small rate hikes are too large for the economy to bear because we have so much debt. So what the bond market is counting on is the recession doing the job for the Fed, meaning that the Fed won't fight inflation with tight money, but simply making money less loose will be enough to tip the economy into recession and the recession will fight inflation because the conventional wisdom is if we have a recession, that is going to reduce demand and that is going to bring down the rate of inflation. So that's what the markets are counting on. It's not the Fed that's going to fight inflation. It's going to be the recession. But the Fed is going to cause the recession with these rate hikes. And that's what they're all referring to as a policy mistake because they're saying, hey, the Fed is going to hike too much and cause a recession. The recession is not the mistake. The recession is the cure for the mistake. The mistakes were made a long time ago. The Fed continues to make mistakes in raising rates too slowly, not because faster rate hikes will cause a recession, but because they're trying to delay the recession because the recession is the cure. But the problem is the economy is so sick, we can't survive the cure. We survived it in 1980 when Reagan and Volcker force-fed that bitter-tasting medicine down the throat of the economy, and we had 20% interest rates. We were 
able to survive that and we had some relative prosperity at the back end, but we can't do it now. I mean, we could in theory in the long run, but given the political realities that will intervene in the short run, there is no way it's going to happen. So what is going to happen then when the economy tips into recession? Inflation is going to get worse, not better. That genie is already out of the bottle. And just because demand is going to go down in America doesn't mean it's going to go down worldwide. And what we all should know by now, that is also a key factor in the supply and demand equation is supply. Supply is also going to go down. In particular, domestic supply is going to go down. Now, I was reading this article about the fracking industry and with oil prices above $90 a barrel and a lot of these key companies are not increasing production. They're just going to enjoy a better return on their investment while they can. And the reason is they don't want to get burned again. They don't want to take the risk because they lost a lot of money last time oil prices were $90, $100 a barrel because they did invest in more drilling and then the price fell out and they lost a ton of money before we continue help us clicking that youtube like button and subscribe now to our channel this shows the algorithm that you valued this information and it helps us spread that message sharing is caring and now let's continue and they're not going to risk making that mistake again so we're not going to get this big increase in domestic supply of oil, even though the price of oil is going up. But the key point I want to make is that oil can be exported. And even if demand for oil in the U.S. goes down as the price goes up, demand can go up outside the United States and more U.S. oil will end up being exported and there'll be even less supplies available for domestic consumption because Americans compete with people all around the world. And the same thing applies to all of our imports. We're running these record imports, but if the dollar tanks, which is what will happen, because if the Fed has to do an about face, if, as I believe is going to happen, the inflation rate is still going to be high. I mean, it could be higher than it is right now, or maybe it'll be a little lower, but it'll definitely be high when the Fed pivots back to more loose instead of less loose. When the Fed has to start taking back whatever rate hikes it managed to get in, when the Fed has to go back to QE, the bottom is going to drop out of the dollar and that's going to drive the cost of imports through the roof. But what's going to happen is as the dollar dumps, that means other currencies are going up and now consumers in other countries can outbid Americans for a lot of the products that were being shipped to America. So now those products aren't going to come to America. They're going to stay outside. Consumers in other countries will buy them. And that restricts the supply of goods coming into America. Meanwhile, as the dollar tanks, American goods are going to become cheaper for foreign consumers to buy. And so our exports will pick up when the dollar really tanks. So fewer goods are going to be coming in more goods are going to be going out. So the domestic supply of goods is going to be shrinking. And even if demand is shrinking to buy those goods because Americans have less money, there's also going to be less stuff. And what matters is the relative relationship between demand and supply. So if demand goes down, but supply goes down more, price can still go up in that environment. And that is what's going to happen. That is stagflation. But the other problem is the recession itself fuels more inflationary monetary and fiscal policy. Because how does the government fight recession? Well, they do exactly what they're doing now to fight inflation, except more of it. They fight recession with expansionary monetary policy and expansionary fiscal policy. But that makes inflation worse. So if you have an inflationary recession, if you're in stagflation and you resort to the classical Keynesian remedies for recession, you are at the same time making the inflation worse. But if the recession is being caused by inflation, what you're doing to make the recession better actually makes the recession even worse by making the inflation problem worse. And that is where we're headed. Look at the data we got on unemployment claims on Thursday. The expectation was for 224,000 new claims, and that would have followed 223,000 in the previous week. Well, they revised up that week from 223 to 225. 
Not that much of a big deal, just 2,000 more. But the recent week, we ended up with 248,000 additional claims for unemployment benefits. That's a 23,000 claim increase over that upwardly revised 225 from the prior week. So this is going in the wrong direction. And I think unemployment is going to continue to rise because real consumer spending is going to fall. But as I've said before on this podcast, There are a lot of layoffs coming in the sector of the economy that has been the biggest bubble, the biggest beneficiary of the misallocation of capital. You have all of these Americans who are employed by money losing companies. And the only reason the money losing companies were able to pay them was because they could sell stock. And the only reason they could sell stock is because investors wanted to buy it. And why did they want to buy it? Because the price was going up and they thought they could get rich. Well, now that the price is collapsing and the people who thought they could get rich are going broke, they're not going to buy any more stock. So the lifeline for these companies is cut off and now they have to start cutting back. They have to start reducing their cash burn, which means they're going to reduce their headcount. So a lot of layoffs. We're going to have rising unemployment, but prices are going to continue to rise. In fact, we still have so much pent up inflation in the pipeline that is yet to show up. And in fact, even if the Fed were fighting inflation today, we wouldn't even see the results for another couple of years because we're still dealing with the consequences of the inflation they created in the past that haven't even caught up to us yet. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy, but the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who, and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.